please welcome Dr. Jonathan Hoffman. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Hoffman, and I'm a program manager in the Microsystems Technology Office. Today, we will demonstrate an exciting result from the Ambien program. With me on stage are Alan Braun from SRI and Tom Kornack from Twinleaf. These are some of the leaders from the Ambient program who have realized this work. Success. The Ambient program seeks to bring biological imaging anywhere. But what is biological imaging in this context? The brain is composed of cells called neurons, which communicate via electrical pulses. Just as with a current in a wire, this creates a magnetic field. While the magnetic field of a single neuron is extraordinarily weak, we take advantage of many neurons synchronizing together, which creates a larger magnetic field. The synchronized magnetic field itself is still incredibly weak outside the scalp, but detectable. Measuring this field is like trying to listen to a person breathing while standing next to a jet engine, a jet taking off. On the left is a cartoon cutout of the anticipated magnetic field outside the scalp from a synchronized group of neurons. On the right is the magnetic frequency response of the brain as a function of time. You can see that the frequencies of interest occur below 100 hertz. The key takeaway here is there's a weak but detectable signal outside the body. Not only can we detect this neural activity, but we can create 3D time-dependent images of it. This is known as magnetoencephalography, or MEG. There are multiple challenges to achieving this in practice. The plot on the left shows the magnetic spectral density on the y-axis versus frequency on the x-axis. The MEG signals fall below the geomagnetic noise, meaning we have a negative signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR. As a result, MEG systems are placed inside magnetically shielded rooms, and these shielded rooms, which are pictured on the far right, are large and cost millions of dollars. This expense provides about a four to five order of magnitude reduction in background noise, enabling significant SNR improvements. Despite the shielding, we still need sensitive magnetometers. MEG systems today comprise arrays of sensitive magnetometers called superconducting quantum interference devices, or SQUIDs. These SQUIDs require cryogenics. Pictured in the center is a 300-channel uh, squid array, which costs about $3.5 million. The cryogenics constrain the user to be stationary with limited motion. The combination of these expenses and constrained motion have limited the utility of MEG, MEG systems. In fact, there's only about 200 of such systems worldwide. Ambient seeks to break away from these constraints. Ambient utilizes magnetic radiometers to reduce the geomagnetic noise occurring far away from the brain to drastically improve the SNR. The picture on the left now plots the magnetic radiometer density versus frequency. We see the noise floor has dropped and the MEG signals are detectable with positive SNR. We no longer require shielded rooms and we could operate anywhere. Ambient is an atom-based magnetometer, known as an optically pumped magnetometer, which does not require cryogenics and can be directly attached to a user's head. This form fit operation is incredibly useful. Cryogenic MEG helmet size is not ideal for all patients, especially children. The helmets accommodate around 80 to 90% of patients, which means it is fundamentally too big for 80% of people. The ambient sensors can be placed and adjusted to each user's head. This means the sensors can be closer to the signal and even allows for users' mobility during MEG operation, enabling a completely new class of studies. There are multiple benefits of MEG. In terms of preclinical use, there's the potential to map stroke damage and to map brain connectivity. Maps of brain connectivity could help us understand chronic pain, Parkinson's disease, or brain maturation. This could even possibly diagnose traumatic brain injury. The picture on the top left shows an MEG of decreased brain connectivity, which could be associated with TBI. Clinical usage includes epilepsy-focused localization or pre-surgical functional mapping. MEG is well-suited for epilepsy studies because brain regions fire together during epileptic events and enhance the measured magnetic field. In epilepsy, MEG can detect and localize the specific pathological regions in the brain. It can also help surgeons understand regions of the brain associated with loss of sensory processing, linguistics, or paralysis. That is, surgeons can know the exact position of essential brain functions, brain regions, excuse me, to avoid surgically induced neurological deficits. 
The image on the right shows the localization of pathological neurons in epilepsy. If we can read the brain, then we could eventually realize various brain-machine interfaces, non-invasively, which is pictured on the bottom left. These interfaces could be used to restore function with brain-controlled prosthetics or to enhance function to improve response times. Another use case is called cognitive load balancing. We can use brain signal measurements for resource management. Imagine if we could sense overload situations in real time and tailor inputs accordingly. This could apply to training situations, IC analysts, or even pilots. While there are many uses of MEG, the question is, can we truly realize this outside of a tip its typical constraints? Can we measure magnetic brain signals outside of a shielded room? The answer is yes. Somewhat obviously, since we're here. Um, pictured on the left is Tom Cormack, who's on, Tom Cornack, who's on stage with me, standing outside. The ambient sensor is at the top of the arrow touching his head. The sensor is powered from the laptop on the right side of the image. In this experiment, we measured an auditorially evoked signal, which you can see on the right side of the, of the plot. This is, the, this is the key first step towards realizing mobile MEG. Currently, we've built a three by three array of these devices and have begun localization studies on a phantom. In fact, we've realized better than five millimeter resolution. Today, we're not going to perform an MEG demo but instead a heart measurement, which is an equally important potential spin-off of this technology. Magnetocardiography, or MCG, is the detection and imaging of magnetic signals from the heart. Cellular currents that initiate the periodic muscle contractions of the heart generate volume currents, which produce magnetic fields near the surface of the chest. These signals are stronger than brain activity due to the highest synchronous nature and activity needed to keep the heart beating at a steady rate. The image on the left shows one component of this magnetic field. Cardiovascular diseases are a leading cause of death globally. Developing a widely usable device that enables identification or localization of abnormalities could result in treatment and potentially the prevention of death. Whilst MCG exists today, it's too expensive and unavailable at patients' bedsides. Developing such a technology could be truly game -changing, a truly game-changing medical device, which we could greatly improve medical intervention for heart disease. While MCG imaging requires arrays of many of these carefully aligned sensors, today we're just going to use one uh, that could go into a future MCG product. Now, before showing the demo and performing the work, I'd like to briefly describe the signal we're going to see. The left image shows a previously recorded signal with the ambient sensor. The y-axis is the gradient magnetic field in picotesla per centimeter, and the x-axis is time. The plot shows 10 seconds of signal averaging from a heartbeat. The first bump is known as the P wave, which is the depolarization and contraction of the atriums. This is followed by the QRS wave, which is the rapid electrical impulses and depolarization of the ventricles. Finally, the T wave is the ventricular repolarization. Now that we know what to expect, let's get to the demo. So we've now switched over to a live feed of the magnetometer. Pictured here in black, this is the entire magnetometer. There's a magneto two magnetometers which form a gradiometer. And what we're imaging on the top is a live feed of the magnetic signal. On the bottom, so that's field ver versus time. On the bottom is a 4A transform of that. What you see is a lot of 60 hertz noise that's everywhere in this room. And if you look at the 4A transform, there's a nice peak at 60 hertz. If we swipe, we can see the, in yellow the premise of ambient, which is that on the bottom we're looking at a gradient which greatly reduces the magnetic background noise from these uh, external signals. And I should say on the Fourier transform, lower is better. If we swipe right again, we now get a filtered live feed of this sensor. And as Tom, who's our puppet today, approaches the sensor, what we'll start to see is that heart signal. So we see that heartbeat picked up live in real time, non-contact manner. And if we swipe right again, this is a time average of each of those beats where we could clearly see the QRS and those T waves, which are medically diagnosable. And so we're really proud of this result. We're very excited to show this and share this with you today. And I hope that we can work together in the future to see how we could transition this technology into medically usable uh, devices. And unfortunately, there is no break, the program ends, but if you could catch us afterwards, we'd be happy to chat and discuss this more. Thank you for your time.